Mathematics and its applications here at the University of Minnesota. My name is Dan Spurn. I'm the uh, director of the Institute. Um, this public lecture series I want to first acknowledge has been supported um, by the National Science Foundation and uh, generous support from the Arnold Family Foundation. The IMA has hosted a public lecture series for the past 20 years with the aim of hosting distinguished scientists whose work resonates with the general public. Past speakers have discussed topics ranging from the use of cryptography in the internet to the design of compact space telescopes using origami. This evening, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Joseph Turan. Dr. Turan is a professor of applied mathematics at the University of California, Los Angeles. His research is focused on numerical methods for partial differential equations arising in classical physics. This includes computational solids, computational fluids, multi-material interactions, fracture dynamics, and computational biomechanics. Professor Turan received his PhD in 2005 from Stanford University, served as a postdoctoral fellow at the Quran Institute at NYU from 2005 to 2007, and since 2007 has been on the faculty at UCLA. Turan has received a 2011 Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers and a 2010 Young Investigator Award for the office, from the Office of Naval Research. In 2008, Discover Magazine named him as a top 20 under 40 scientist. He has worked with Disney on a number of, of projects, as we'll see. I think it's quite appropriate that on our, on our first cold and snowy day in the Twin Cities, we have a public lecture entitled, Snow Business, Scientific Computing for the Movies and Beyond. So uh, please let us welcome Dr. Turan. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna talk a lot about uh, my work with um, Walt Disney Animation at Burbank Studios. Um, and uh, I work there as a consultant, but most of my time I spend at UCLA where I'm a professor in the math department. Um, specifically, I work on applied math. In applied math, I work on scientific computing. And in scientific computing, I work on numerical methods for PDEs. And I'm going to talk about some exciting new applications of um, numerical methods for PDEs, namely um, movie, spe movie special effects and things like virtual surgery. And so uh, the natural question is, uh, what does uh, making uh, animated movies have to do with solving PDEs numerically? <laughs> and uh, the short answer is realistic dynamics. So uh, when they create the movies, they have to create the virtual world of the movie, virtual trees, virtual characters, virtual water. Uh, everything that you see in the movie has to be created um, digitally on the computer. And they've been doing this since uh, Toy Story, so about 20 years now. They've gotten pretty good at making that virtual world look like the real world. <coughs> and uh, uh, particularly, if you just look at a single frame of the movie, it can be hard to distinguish it from an actual photograph of the real world. So as they've raised the bar for realism in the static sense, um, they've also raised the bar for the dynamics of the virtual materials in the movie. So if you have something like water in the movie and you see a photograph uh, or see a frame of the movie rendered, it looks just like a glass of water. If the water doesn't also slosh around in the cup exactly like it would in the real world, you start to notice that something looks funny about the water. Like you notice that, oh, that doesn't look like water. It looks more like a, a weird crystal gravy or something like that. <laughs> so uh, you get into this uh, phenomenon that's called the uncanny valley. So to help them beat this uncanny, val uh, uncanny valley phenomena, uh, they can actually use uh, the governing uh, physics to help the animators move the materials around in a manner that's realistic enough. So that's where we come in, is solving those um, partial differential equations. And the partial differential equations that govern these phenomena, uh, more or less everything I'm going to show in the talk is, um, obeys this PDE. There's some ambiguity, because um, depending on the material, we'll get a different notion of the stress in the material. But um, classical physics through the continuum tells us, um, when we apply Newton's laws, that we have a, a force uh, density balance. So basically, for anything, water, smoke, gelatin, armadillo, getting hit with a ball. <laughs> For any of these things, they're obeying basically Newton's laws, which we express through the PDE. So we're going to solve these PDEs numerically because we can't solve them with a pen and paper because they're too nonlinear and nasty. And 
use that as a tool to help the animators move their stuff around in a manner that looks realistic. So in the industry, the types of materials that they have to use a numerical PDE for are often called uh, natural phenomena. And natural phenomena can include things like smoke, fire, splashing water, draping clothing, um, lots of things you might expect like fire and smoke, but other things like draping clothing you wouldn't think that you have to solve a PDE numerically for. But it turns out that you do. And uh, whenever these things come up in industry, um, we're going to label them as natural phenomena here. So uh, there's a sort of funny uh, aspect to these things, which is when you're, when you're working out the numerics for a different material, like water or clothing here, it's actually the everyday phenomena that are more difficult to get right. So when you have the dynamics of something like a glass of water in the movie, we're really, really familiar with it. So we know what it should look like because we see it every day. So that means that if we don't get the visual realism and the dynamics right, you just you really notice it. If it's something that's more sensational, like an exploding fireball or a building crumbling to the ground, you haven't really seen it before, so uh, there's a lot less sensitivity to it. So let's take the example of uh, water pouring into a cup here. Um, this is just a demo that I used to demonstrate the point. This is a simulation of the Navier-Stokes equations uh, with free surface boundary conditions. Here we've got water flowing in through a pipe and just filling up a cup. This is just um, a demo that I had my graduate student put together in about like an hour or so. Um, it's not quite movie quality, but it's the same algorithm that they would use to do the, the, the water waves from Moana. And so here, uh, it looks pretty real. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think twice about seeing it in the movie. Um, but if we run the exact same sim again, but this time increase the viscosity beyond that what you would expect for water, <laughs> it's something that doesn't look right. <laughs> so uh, you, don't, you don't want to have the, uh, the water look like that in the movies. <laughs> and the, the, cra the crazy thing is that it turns out it's easier to use the PDE to tell you how these things move around than to have an artist go in and actually try to manually control them. It's actually easier just to use the physics of the PDE to get it for you. Um, so as I said before, the sort of sensational phenomena actually turn out to be a little bit um, easier. So crazy things like two fireballs on a collision course that explode uh, in this fiery inferno. Uh, a little easier to do than pouring water. To demonstrate the point here on this one, uh, these aren't actually fireballs. They're actually snowballs um, that we used for the movie Frozen but they, uh, ha they're simulated in zero gravity, and we give each snowball some appreciable angular velocity, and it looks like fireballs. <laughs> so you have, a lot more, you have a lot more leeway for things that are more sensational that you don't see every day. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about how we use discrete PDEs to make the movies. So when you make the movie, you have to make uh, each frame in the movie, so you have 30 static images per second of movie that you have to generate. And so each one of those frames in the movie uh, is going to then just be a collection of discrete pixels, right? So you usually have a lot more pixels than that, <laughs> but uh, you see uh, what I mean here, right? So you've got to color each one of the pixels in the frame to uh, make the movie. And to color the pixels, we synthesize photography of the digital world of the movie, right? So when you've got your movie, if you have a movie with three spheres in it, <laughs> Then you've got the world of the movie, which is these three spheres on the ground. And they're represented by some discrete representation, because everything in the movie has to be discrete in the, in the digital world. So these spheres we're going to idealize as some polyhedral mesh. And for each pixel in the frame that we need to generate, we're going to figure out how light sources in the actual world would scatter light into the scene, bounce all around, and then come flying through a, a pixel and into the camera. And that's sort of like traditional computer graphics research. Computer graphics has gotten really, really good at synthesizing photography of the CG world here. This is sort of like the level, this would have been like a graduate, um, graduate class in rendering homework assignment when I was in graduate school to get this level of realism. So you can really get um, the static frame looking almost like uh, the real world nowadays. And so uh, again, we've got this discrete notion, this spatially discrete notion of everything in the scene. So whatever we're looking at, it has to be some collection of polygons or points or some, primitive, some geometric primitives that we only have a finite number of. But that's not too limiting as long as we have quite a few geometric primitives. So, so as long as we can build um, 
complicated shapes out of our basic primitives here, we can still be quite expressive. If you look at this elephant here, you can see that we're going to tend to want to use quite a lot of these geometric primitives if we want to get sufficient vi visual realism. Um, so we tend to need more um, spatial resolution to get the, the really impressive modern effects. And then um, when we're going to create the dynamics of the scene, all you're going to do is you're going to take the vertices of these, poly these polyhedra and you're just going to move them around. So if I'm at frame n, they're in some location. And then I can think of grabbing each one of them and moving them to some other location in the next frame. Um, that would be pretty expensive because here you probably have about 10,000 of them or so. Um, and the ideal case for something like this, we're getting up into millions of the little vertices of the polyhedra. And so asking an animator to go in and move them around to give the motion in the movie is just too much work. Right? So this is where we're going to use a PDE to, um, to tell us automatically through the code how each one of those vertices should behave according to the laws of physics. So if I take something like this dragon mesh here, where I'm going to build it out of a bunch of, instead of um, um, unstructured polygons here, I'm going to build it out of a bunch of um, deformable bricks. Think about uh, building it out of um, squishy, squishy Legos. And then I'm going to say where the vertex of each one of those squishy Legos moves according to a PDE. And that will automatically give me the motion of how the dragon would deform if it was made out of jello. <laughs> And, and I prescribed where its head went through a boundary condition in the PDE, and I prescribed where its feet went through other boundary conditions in the PDE. So I automatically get where the millions of vertices go from the PDE, rather than asking the animator to go in and do it by hand. So there's all different flavors of the, the notion of discrete space that we have in the world of the computer, uh, the world of the movie. So uh, we're only ever going to see the boundary of the characters in the movie unless we're taking an x-ray of them or something. But for physics, oftentimes we need to fill in the guts of the characters too with more mesh facets. So sometimes in addition to ha just having um, polygons on the boundary, we actually need um, polyhedra like um, tetrahedra here that fill up the guts of the characters as well. And then to animate these things, we would, move, we would be moving, where, moving around all the vertices even of the inside um, to get the motion. In the case of the water that we saw a minute ago, we're using, we, we, we've disconnected all the edges in the polyhedron mesh. So rather than moving around all of the polygons um, and keeping them connected, we're just going to take out all the edges in the polygon mesh and just move their vertices around in an unstructured way. And so here you can see what the numerical simulator is directly controlling. So we'll put a fancy surface around these particles and render them to give the effect that you see in the movies. But as far as the physics is concerned, we're only tracking here, a few hundred thousand particle samples of the fluid, and then using the PDE to tell us where each one of those little point mass samples of it should go. So we've got discrete time, discrete pixels, discrete space for the geometric um, primitives, but we also need to have a discrete notion of the physics. And really that comes from introducing our discrete notion of time and our discrete notion of space here. It's going to transform our um, PDE first into an ODE by discretizing in space, and then uh, into a system of algebraic equations when we discretize in time. Now, I'm not going to get into that too much in this talk, but I'll give you a super basic version of it uh, just to give you an idea of how we do it. So if we do something like just a baseball, then we don't need to use a PDE because we can just idealize the body as just a, a simple point mass as opposed to like a whole continuum of point masses. And we can look at its um, governing equations through the non-PDE version of F equals MA, which is just going to tell us that the rate of change of the velocity is going to be equal to uh, the acceleration. And acceleration is going to be, uh, when we multiply it by mass, is going to balance out um, the gravitational force. And that will tell us, uh, given the initial position, initial velocity, the parabolic trajectory of the ball. Now, in this case, you actually can solve the ODE analytically, but let's look at how we can approximate it using the discrete notion of time. So if we introduce a discrete notion of time, we can change the um, derivatives or rates of change over the infinitesimal notion of time down to their um, discrete version where we just look at how they change across one frame in the movie. So let's look at going from frame n to frame n plus 1. Right? So we want to know where the ball is at time n. So we can color in the frames at time n, and we want to figure out where it should go 
in time n plus 1 based on the governing physics. So we know that given velocity at time n and the acceleration we have, we know that the new velocity uh, will be related to just the acceleration and what it used to be. And then we know that the rate of change of position is going to be the velocity. So we can say, OK, now given that I know what the new velocity is going to be, I knew the old position, then I can figure out what the new position is. And I can use this just as uh, uh, an algorithm that's just a recipe for saying how I go from xn to xn plus 1 to xn plus 2 to xn plus 3 to automatically move that thing around in a manner that's consistent with the physics. So uh, that's uh, a very simple version, but it's basically directly analogous to what we get when we look at the PDE. So when we have a more complicated object, object than just a point mass baseball, if we have something like a shirt here, we're going to say that the shirt has the physics of an elastic membrane, a thin elastic membrane. And when we discretize the PDE that expresses the dynamics of a thin elastic membrane, what we're going to get is what something that looks like a bunch of those little baseballs, but that are connected together by uh, springs. Now, they're not really springs, but they effectively act like springs. So basically, in addition to having the force of gravity acting on each one of these baseballs, we have another force that comes from the material strength that's just going to say that these two particles want to stay very close together, and these two particles want to stay close together, and so on. And so we end up getting a coupled system of algebraic equations um, that will tell us how to move these vertices around. So it's not always as easy as just um, knowing uh, that the, this point only needs to know about itself to go to the next time step. This point would need to know about this point. This point would need to know about this point, and so on. You get a much more uh, complicated um, game to play to move these things around. So uh, if it's something like a, a shirt, we can use the, uh, the physics of an elastic membrane. For hair, it's simple. It's, uh, it's similarly simple. What we tend to use is uh, uh, the physics of an elastic curve, where we just look at um, penalizing change in um, length along one of those hairs. So each hair here is just a bunch of those little particles connected together with segments. For things like skin, uh, we actually need to use the, the guts of the material, too. So we have conductivity all through the particles in the, in the, inter, in the interior of the mesh. Uh, unstructured particles are also very useful for things like water, sand, mud, snow. Um, and that's sort of like the, the water pouring into the cup in the non-fancy rendering that I showed you. Um, so now let me show you um, some examples here. So uh, here is an example from a paper we just did this last summer where we show that our, our clothing um, uh, elastic membrane simulator can handle contact and collision between lots of different layers of clothing at very high resolution. So here, these um, elastic membrane sheets here are made up of millions of triangles. Right? So we have millions of the little baseball particles and millions of triangles in these um, uh, little rectangular patches here. And we're able to simulate their physics in uh, about a minute per frame or so. And so this is a famously difficult problem for the effects industry because uh, you need to put clothing on your characters when you animate them. So typically, the animator, animators will, control, will animate the character without any clothing on. And then it's too difficult to animate the clothing dynamics by hand, so they'll run a simulation that says, OK, use the covering equations of physics and bounce the clothes off the animated um, character uh, to get the dynamics that you see in the movie. But there's a tricky constraint to that, which is that each one of these membranes needs to know about the other membrane so that it doesn't fly through itself. So basically, uh, you have a constraint on the dynamics, which is that uh, these guys shouldn't cross over one another. And this can fail pretty spectacularly in practice, which is like if you have a character that has a t-shirt, a button-up shirt, and then a sweater on, you can see the dynamics of the t-shirt will bring it flying through the other uh, layers in the garment, and uh, you get an uncanny valley again where they have like teleporting clothes. <laughs> so this is a, a pretty big success for us that we did um, last summer. Uh, for hair, the case is, is, is even worse, because basically, for a hair, we only have conductivity in the uh, uh, direction of the curve, which means that it can bump into uh, to other curves in, in so many more ways. And uh, this was a demo that we put together uh, before the movie Tangled came out because they knew they were going to have a lot of hair in that movie, so we needed to revisit the, uh, the hair simulation engine. And this was, uh, uh, in this case, we actually simulated the, the way we tend to simulate uh, uh, the clothing is if it's in a vacuum. And so we tend to, we use it to simulate the hair as if it was in a vacuum too. But for this paper, 
we were looking at actually simulating the air that surrounds the hair as well. And we saw that it actually made the dynamics of the hair actually look a little bit more realistic, especially this like um, shearing that we see there. Uh, looked a lot better when we consider the fact that it's not hair in a vacuum that you're interested in, it's hair being surrounded by a fluid. Um, this is another example from a paper that we did last summer. Uh, in this case, uh, this is something that's sort of just now, uh, now possible for us to do. So now that we can really, now we have algorithms that let us up the number of particles in the sim into the millions, we can simulate the, uh, a sweater by saying that this isn't really an elastic membrane anymore. We're going to simulate every yarn in the garment as if it was an elastic curve and then handle the frictional contact between each yarn in the garment. And then we're able to get much more um, realistic looking things like this where we have um, um, the thickness that you see from the individual yarns as well as the bending resistance. Um, this algorithm, we're even, in, in this case, we're actually simulating one yarn as if it, each individual yarn in the garment as if it's just a curve. But in some examples that I'll show later on, we could actually even simulate each individual thread in the yarn and the frictional contact between each one of the individual threads. So we were trying to just show off all the stuff we could do with yarn. So we're like, what else can you do with yarn besides a sweater? Uh, well, how about a bath mat? <laughs> so here we have a, a stress test of collision with a like, sort of fuzzy bath mat that looks like one that I saw at Ikea once. Uh, I don't think that's the same pattern, though. No. Um, so here's, here's an example of our knit simulator where we simulate multiple um, threads per yarn here. And we're able to get this sort of burlap sack type behavior. Um, what's, what's funny about this is uh, uh, sometimes, sometimes at Disney, the movie drives the technology, but they're open to the technology driving the movie. So, so given this is sort of a hot off the presses technology, there was some discussion in the studio about trying to drive some of the aspects of the storytelling from the fact that we can simulate these materials really well. Um, so uh, continuing in the, in the uh, uh, elasticity category here, uh, we get to what I'll call volumetric elasticity. And so for volumetric elasticity, this is we're, we're running, we're solving PDEs over like the dragon or uh, that Buddha mesh where the volume is filled up with tetrahedra. So we're moving around all the vertices of the tetrahedra mesh according to a PDE through the volume. And when we use the physics of elasticity, we can do all sorts of things, but I always think about Jello <laughs> as the, uh, I don't know why, <laughs> as the, uh, uh, the best example for this. Here we're just sort of putting our algorithms through, through some, um, some stress tests. So, so whatever you're doing in a, in a movie, there's usually going to be a lot of contact and collision, as well as extreme deformation. Um, and we're just showing that our algorithms basically are robust to that, and they won't crash and explode. Um, when we develop these algorithms, uh, we're going to give them to animators. So the animators have varying levels of backgrounds in math and physics um, and computer science. So sometimes we need to make it so that they, they don't need to know. Or ideally, we need to make it so they don't, need, they don't know a lot about the guts of the algorithm that we're using. And uh, when you come up with a numerical algorithm, there are a lot of different parameters that go into it. Mass, stiffness, number of discrete elements, time step size, um, number of iterations in your linear solver, all kinds of parameters that require expert user knowledge. And this parameter space is multidimensional, and, and you don't always get good results from every choice of the parameters, right? In fact, there's a really narrow um, sub-manifold of, of parameters that are not insane. So uh, in the sense that if I, if, I gave my, if I gave my algorithm bad parameters, it would run, it would explode, right? It would go unstable and give a, a crazy answer. So, Given that we're give it, we need to give these algorithms to non-expert users, we want to try to expand the parameter space as wide as possible so that it doesn't explode or look crazy. So a, a lot of this for, for um, the artist, is, uh, when it comes to elasticity, is to make algorithms that let us do the most extreme deformation possible without going unstable. So a lot of times we like to put these um, elastic materials into extreme stress conditions like cannonball impacts or crushed in gears to make sure that an artist could take this and go crazy with it, and the sim would still give them a reasonable result. And so there aren't very many movies where you're hitting uh, elastic armadillos with cannonballs that I know of, uh, but uh, it does get used in the studio quite often now. So we designed this about six years ago. Um, this character is from, uh, does anybody know? Tangled. Uh, no clothes on him, but 
uh, we're, we're, we're using here, here to illustrate a part of the pipeline called skinny. So when they want to animate a character, the, the, the motion of a character in the movie, the, ultimately you need to move around the vertices of the polyhedron mesh of this guy to block out his motion. But there's hundreds of thousands of those vertices, so you're not just going to go in there and pull one of them around individually. It would take forever, and it would, be, and it would look bad. Instead, you're going to say, OK, let me animate the skeleton of the guy. So the skeleton has far fewer degrees of freedom. It's got like tens of degrees of freedom, maybe hundreds, depending on how crazy you want to get, but not hundreds of thousands to millions, which the skin would have. So given that it's easy to animate the skeleton, just move this guy around, well, then how do you move the skin around? So you have to solve this extrapolation problem, which is given that I know where the bones go and I know where the skin was relative to the bones at time zero, how should I extrapolate the skin position based on the motion of the skeleton? In about 2011 or so, we convinced them that they could figure out where the skin goes by solving a PDE. So we can solve a PDE, a PDE that comes from the um, elasticity of the material that connects the bones to the skin, and look at it either as quasi-static, which says that we look where the um, potential energy is minimized subject to the constraint of where the bones go, or including the inertia effects, which is just um, the original Newton's laws. And so here I'll show you some examples of that. So here we see they've animated the skeleton below, and we're going to solve a PDE to jiggle the skin around. Or uh, so this 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 one includes the effect of inertia. The one that says quasi statics does not. And at the bottom here, I'm going to show you the motion of the skeleton. Here you can see you animate that skeleton, and then the skin is moved around as a post process. That blue cage that you see there is uh, the discrete notion that the PDE sees. So that's like building like a, a brick lattice around the character like we did with the dragon mesh. What's tricky about this in production is that we have to resolve those collision con constraints at the armpits and the elbows, uh, which can be rather difficult to satisfy. But if we don't resolve collision constraint at the armpits and the elbows, it can put the clothing simulation in a really difficult place, right? So, so first they're going to do the skinning um, extrapolation to move the skin around based on the bones, and then they're going to have to put clothing on the guy and run another sim that bumps the clothing off the, the skin simulation. If the skin simulation collides, then it puts the clothing simulator in a really difficult spot. So when we developed this for them, we had to resolve the pinching at the armpits and the elbows very accurately, and we had to make it run really, really fast. So when we give these algorithms to the artists, they have to run really quickly. They have to run re in real time, if possible, which means that to get one frame of the movie, it takes 1 30th of a second to run a simulation. Usually we don't hit that rate. We hit a few seconds to get one frame is, 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 is what we see um, for our directability. But we, we spent about three years basically developing an algorithm that was fast enough at approximating the PDE that they could use this in art direction. So basically, like they're going to have to animate this guy many, many times until they get the approval of the director. So if they want to use a numerical PDE to say where the skin goes, that PE has to be solved, be solved very, very quickly, or it's going to take like 10 years to get your movie done. But about 2011 or so, we got it going fast enough that we could use it in production. And now it's used in more or less all of the characters um, as a post-processing for the skin, particularly for the more rotund characters like this guy, and uh, uh, for a lot of the characters in Zootopia. So for the elasticity of the jowls in this guy, in this, in this character here, I forget his name. I think it's Clawhauser, I think is his name. Uh, that you can really see the elasticity sim for how his cheeks move around. Yeah, all kinds of PDEs right there. <laughs> So uh, water we've seen. Water is the collection of unstructured points here. Here you can see, again, the unstructured points without the mesh connectivity. Um, unstructured points is, are, are really popular uh, in the effects industry these days. We, we, use this, we almost prefer this, this type of representation uh, whenever we can. Um, here's another example with unstructured points. This is a simulation of lava. So to, we're, we're simulating lava here, including the effects of temperature-based phase change, some basic heat transfer, and then otherwise we're saying that the lava is elastoplastic. And we developed this actually the, the year after we did Frozen. 
And we didn't really do it for any good reason other than that we wanted to melt stuff after we had, we really wanted to melt snow. <laughs> but then we just started uh, doing molten rock. And we, and, uh, we I, I did this just a collaboration with Disney. And uh, uh, one of uh, our Disney colleagues was talking to the CTO and he was like, oh, that's great. Um, you know we're doing a lava, lava movie next, right? And we're like, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, we knew we were doing a lava movie. <laughs> but so th this was fortuitously done in time for Moana, which had quite a lot of lava in it. This is actually an early demo for the lava in Moana. Um, so unstructured particles is really our preferred um, representation for things that, that do a lot of um, flowing and changing shape. Um, we also use them for things like sand dynamics. This is actually a, a paper that we did about two years after doing the snow in Frozen. When we did Frozen, um, everybody was based out of LA, so uh, I figured we should probably do sand if we're doing snow in LA. <laughs> so we did sand about two papers later. Uh, we really like to have algorithms that let us couple all of our materials together. Now here we've got clothing coupled with sand. This is a few hundred thousand grains of sand to give you an idea. Um, a few hundred thousand grains of sand is actually sort of a very coarse sand, almost more of a gravel. Here is what you get if you run with seven million grains of sand. As you can imagine, the algorithms take longer to run as we add more grains of sand, so we have to really optimize our code and think about the algorithms in lots of different ways to get them run f to run fast enough that the artist will use this. But this is at about a few minutes per frame, so that's well within the, uh, the uh, performance that the studios are okay with. Um, adding the effects of wetness to sand is something we wrote another paper on last year, um, which ended up being a small modification to the dry sand equations. Um, in this paper, um, we can simulate sand on its own as if it's uh, varying degrees of wet, but we can also um, couple in the effects of water with sand um, uh, by using some porous uh, media equations. Here we've got two species. We've got a water species and a sand species, and they interact through a momentum exchange term. That lets us do all kinds of more interesting things with, um, with the sand, uh, but we have to add a lot of layer of physics to do this, which is the physics of porous media. Uh, this one is actually motivated by, I think, like a nine-year-old's YouTube video of him making like a sand dam and then putting his Lego guys on it and letting it get eroded by water. Uh, but putting all these together, water, sand, mud, and snow, you start, well, not snow, <laughs> water, sand, mud, and lava, uh, you get a lot of the components that went into Moana. Here you can see varying degrees of water simulation, sand simulation, and lava simulation eventually. We, we wrote a paper uh, uh, based on the, the water work that we did in Moana. Uh, well, we wrote two papers. We wrote one version of our paper for the computer graphics literature, and then two months ago, we published a version of it for the computational physics literature. So most of the time, we're borrowing from the computational physics to help make the movies, but sometimes the work we do for the movies actually goes the other way and contributes to the computational physics literature. When we were doing Moana, we had to write our own fluid solver uh, that uh, did well with um, distributed computing because these water waves required hundreds of millions of particles um, to, to, um, to get a good look. So when I have the water pouring into a cup, that's a, hundred, a few hundred thousand particles. But when you have a giant wave like that, you need hundreds of millions. And one, one computer alone wasn't enough. We needed a whole cluster of computers to do it. Let's see. There's a couple more examples with um, bunny destruction. Um, <laughs> Here we're just doing more, uh, more heat, um, heat um, transfer and phase change. These are the raw particles without the fancy rendering. Here you can see the particles colored based on their temperature and the heat, in the, in the heat transfer. more melting bunnies. Um, so uh, these simulations, uh, for when, we, when, we're, when we're working on um, movie applications, we have the luxury of computing, of spending more than a 30th of a second of computation time to produce the 1 30th of a second frame in the movie. Usually like a few minutes per frame is the luxury we have for making movies. But if we want to make a video game, then we have a strict constraint on how long it takes to compute a frame, and that's the frame amount, which is a 30th of a second. 
But if we can come up with a simulator that can hit that um, computational constraint, then we can have applications that aren't just movies, but are video games, um, but quite physically realistic video games. So when I started doing my, um, my postdoc in 2005, uh, there was a surgeon in the um, NYU Medical School who was really excited about simulating surgery um, using governing physical equations. And so we started looking into creating a biomechanical simulator for virtual surgery. And the idea for this is like a flight simulator for surgery. And so you can, you, you can imagine applications where you can train surgeons to do um, new procedures or even doing R&D on different types of um, hypothetical procedures. Uh, in 2005, uh, we didn't have a lot of computing power. We could only hit that real-time constraint by simulating a few thousand degrees of freedom uh, in real time. So if we have just a few thousand degrees of freedom, think of that as having just a few thousand Legos, right? So to do a Lego version of the guy from Tangled, we need hundreds of thousands of Legos. But given that we can only do a few thousand degrees of freedom, a few thousand uh, of those bricks in real time, uh, it severely limits the, the geometry of what we can handle. So I was trying to tell the surgeon this at the time. He said, oh, don't worry, don't worry. We can, we can do things like z-plasty. So I said, well, what's a z-plasty? He said, oh, it's, uh, it's, it's this. So, and he showed me this picture, which I, I don't know where you got the picture from, but this is where I got these photos. So for a z-plasty, you use this to um, improve the, the cosmetic appearance of scars, but you can, use, you can also use it to redirect scars into skin folds or to elongate um, um, contracted scar tissue. So often if you, if you get a scarring, it can change the elastic properties of the skin. And you can use a um, plastic seizure for surgery to, um, to manipulate the skin to give it um, mo motion similar to what it had before the scarring. And so basically, like, if you've got a scar here, and you want to elongate the tissue in the direction of the scar, what you can do is make an incision along the scar, which is now stiffer from the scarring, and then um, tee off these two incisions to make a Z shape. And then that's going to create two peninsulas of tissues, uh, tissue with um, E being the tip of one and F the tip of the other. And you can transpose these, so take E to D, F to C. And by doing that transposition, you end up putting healthy tissue in the direction of the scar, and you give uh, elongation of the skin in that direction. And uh, it's a lot easier to watch the simulator do this than it is to hear me describe it. But here's our real-time simulator from 2005 for doing this procedure. The bottom here, you can see we lay down a, a texture before and after the operation so you can sort of see where things went. Uh, we were able to verify some certain conventional wisdom for these, which is um, the optimality of the angle of the incision in the, in the Z-plasty. So when you make that, when you tee off the, uh, the wings of the Z, conventional wisdom says that 60 degrees gives you optimal elongation for the angle of that Z. If you do 45 degrees, something less than 60 degrees, you get suboptimal elongation, and you get sort of a non-orthogonal shape of the scar. And if you do more than 60 degrees, you get what's the, the so-called dog ear effect, where the tissue doesn't fit back in the plane. And the surgeon was particularly excited about the fact that we were able to recreate this, because apparently this is a, uh, a common error that the residents make when they're trying these uh, in, in initial stages. Um, so we were happy about that. Um, but uh, at this point, I'm going to talk in a little more detail about uh, the work that we did for Frozen um, to conclude the talk. So for Frozen, uh, we developed a new algorithm called the material point. Well, we, we, we used the method from the, physical, the computational physics literature called the material point method for approximating the equations of snow. And we got into this because when the movie started, they didn't have, snow wasn't really in the natural phenomena category. We didn't, they didn't have a simulator for snow in-house. And they knew they were going to have a lot of snow in the movie. The snow was going to be moving around a lot, and they needed a physics-based approach for animating it. So there was a lot of discussion about uh, what is the physics of snow and how, what is the best way to discretize uh, the governing PDE or ODE conception. And uh, we started through a summer intern project to explore this with uh, my student. That's my student, Pan, there. And we looked into the, uh, the engineering literature for how to describe the physics of snow, and it was quite vast. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, opinions on how you should model snow, but for the most part, it's considered to be elastoplastic. So elastoplastic, in this context, means that snow is, it wants to hold its shape, right? So when it falls on the ground, it will stay, uh, more or less hold its shape. But as you step into it, uh, you'll dent it, 
right? It wants to be elastic, but you push it too much with your foot, and it's going to create and it's going to obtain a new rest state. So, if, so materials that are that are like that uh, are um, uh, termed to be elastoplastics. They're, they're elastic, but that no th that phenomena of changing its rest state uh, is what we'll call plastic. And it basically just means that in the, the, for the stress in the material, it can only be so big, at which point it, it yields. Um, so snow is this elastoplastic material, which is basically very, very similar to the jello that we had falling in the cup, except that the stress can only get so big. And uh, in addition, in the context we're looking at, snow is going to need to fracture and go flying all over the place. So we need to come up with an algorithm that can handle elastoplastic materials with lots and lots of fracture. So given these two um, observations about snow, we figured that the material point method was a really natural candidate for the um, discretization of the governing physics. And the material point method is a hybrid Lagrange Eulerian method. So for this one, we basically want to think of the snow in two ways. We want to think of it as unstructured points, like we had for the water falling in the cup, sometimes. But then other times, we want to think of it as like structured Legos like we had for the, uh, for the dragon mesh. And depending on what we're doing, we want to think of it in, in, in one way or the other. So that means we need to be able to switch back and forth between these two representations very rapidly. So we want to say, OK, sometimes I like to think of the snowball as these particles. Sometimes I like to think of these structured red particles. But depending on what I'm doing, I need to be able to switch the view. Uh, and then we're going to discretize the physics based on the finite element method, where we do the finite element method discretization over this red grid. That's a little bit beyond the scope of the talk, but I'll tell you a little bit about at least the state of uh, the material. So as far as the snowball is concerned here, its primary state is arguably Lagrangian. So for each little particle of the snowball, this snowball here actually has hundreds of thousands of particles in it, but here you can see with some simplified view. Uh, each part for each particle, we store its mass, just like the baseball. We store its position, just like the baseball. Velocity, just like the baseball. And then other stuff that we have to have for the PDE. <laughs> so we, uh, this, these are all analogous to the baseball, but then we've got some other material that we need for the more complicated structural response in the physics. Particularly, we have to store the spatial derivative of the motion of the material, as well as a little um, notion of the, uh, the volume local to a particle. So you can think of this, this, this big snowball here as having a, a, a total volume of snowball, and then it's going to get divided um, equally, well, not well, potentially equally among each of its constitutive particles, and that's a VP0. So then to march the state forward, we're going to need to change state at some point to the structured particle view. And to change state to the structured particle view, we can just do it through interpolation, basically. So if I, have, if I had, say, the red particle representation of the snowball, and I wanted to switch to green particles, well, I can just do that by interpolation. I can interpolate from the structured grid uh, locations to the green, the green particle locations, just using interpolating functions over the grid. And then if I want to go the other way, if I want to go from green to red, I can actually just do that by uh, what is the transpose of that operation. So basically, there's a, a very simple logic for how we switch between the two representations, and it's a linear representation. So given that mechanism for switching from particle mass and particle momentum to grid mass and grid velocity, uh, we can then update the velocities on the red grid based on the mechanical strength uh, in the material. So this is just like what we did for the baseballs, except for now that we see we have to update all of those red particles in unison because they're coupled through this forcing term. Um, and this forcing term is what comes through the mechanical strength. So this, if, if we didn't have this here, that would be like the baseballs, right? If we just had this, this would be like what we had for the baseballs. But then once we've updated the momentum on the grid, we can interpolate the velocity from the grid back to the particle and then move the particle based on that velocity. So it's, it's very similar to what we did in the baseball, just with some additional overhead in the mechanical response, as well as switching back and forth between green and red particles here and here. So this is the schematic of the code that we use to advance the state for the artist. Right? So given, given this machinery, we can say, OK, tell me where the snowball is at time 0, and then the simulation will march through and tell me how to move each one of those particles. So here's some of the initial demos that we gave to the director when making the movie. And uh, I wasn't in this meeting, but I was told that it was a lunch meeting. They showed these demos to the director. And there was all kinds of hypothetical things that they were using, going to use for the movies that they were showing to the director. 
and the director would then either approve or disapprove of the potential um, technology. And approval was expressed through ringing a bell. <laughs> I don't know why they couldn't just say yes or no. And they're just ringing a bell. So, and, and then when they, when they saw these snowballs, uh, apparently they were just ringing the bell like crazy. <laughs> so so uh, that's a story that I always like to tell. <laughs> but we were pretty excited by the level of realism we were able to get um, for the snow dynamics here. Here's some more of the basic um, early phase demos that we did. This is hundreds of thousands of particles again in contrast to like the hundreds of millions of particles in the water for Moana or like the little, the hundreds of thousands of particles used for filling the cup of water. More basic snowballs. Here I'll show you some of the building blocks of the physics. So this material point method is really good at simulating things that fracture. So if we take our snow and we say that instead of being elastoplastic, it's just elastic. So let's say that snow doesn't have this notion of forgetting its rest state. So think of snow that if you step on it, and you pick your foot up, it just springs right back up. If we, if we get rid of that plasticity effect and we put that physics into our simulator, this is what our snow would look like. And so uh, it's good in that it fractures, but it looks more like some weird foam rubber, like um, this kind of sand that my daughter has in her preschool, it looks like to me, it's like memory sand or something. But, um, <clears throat> but this is what you would get from the algorithm for just doing elasticity. And one of the funny things about it is that the algorithm is very good at fracture. It will fracture no matter what. But it also means that you can't control the fracture. If you didn't want to fracture, then you would be, have a hard time with this algorithm. Here's what we get if we just say that the snow just forgets its rest state when it's deformed too much. And it's starting to look a lot better if we just add that, plastic, that notion of plasticity to it. But we, we, we're, we added another layer to the plasticity for the snow, which is that we wanted it to harden. So we wanted to capture the effect that if, when snow flows plastically, so you can think of taking a snowball and packing it and packing it, it gets stiffer. So if we say that as the snow flows plastically, it gets stiffer um, and weaker as it expands, we get uh, something that looks like this, which is what we used in the final movie. So this is basically just like this, except adding the effect that it would get stiffer as you pack the snow. And so you can see it's stiffening as it's compacting and hitting the, the square there. So in the end, we have to give this to the artists. So we want to have as few knobs as possible for them to play around with to so keep them from getting into trouble by giving it bad parameters. And so we gave them just about four knobs to control. Here you have the Young's modulus of the elastic part of the snow. And this is the um, critical compression at which point it starts to yield plastically, critical stretching at which point it starts to yield plastically, and the rate of hardening. So this controls how, how quickly it will get stiff as you're squeezing it. And with just these four knobs, you can get quite a variety of snow types from playing around with those parameters. And the artists were starting to, we, we ran like hundreds of these sims exploring the parameter space when we were um, initially doing the paper. And then we showed those, um, those uh, sims to the artists and they gave them names like fresh, chunky, wet, sticky. And then they just, get, then they just bake those presets in, right? So then you just have the preset for sticky and they don't need to change any knobs. Uh, <laughs> so here's, here's one of the demos that we did in the early days. We're just trying to think of what's the most generic snow stuff you can do if you can simulate snow. So I, I wanted to do the, the like cartoon snowball rolling down a hill that just gets bigger and bigger. Um, but this one just always looked weird to me because, I don't know, in the 80s, we didn't have the level of quality in the cartoons that you guys have now. But I always thought of the snowball as just expanding as a bigger sphere as it goes down the hill, not sort of rolling up like a carpet like this. And so I was just saying, hey, you know, this, maybe we're taking too many liberties with the plasticity law. I don't think it, the physics is quite right. Um, but my, the first author on the paper was like, oh, no, this is totally right. That's what Snow would do. I know for sure. And he's Russian, of course. He was a Russian guy. <laughs> I, I grew up in California, so, I mean, we have Tahoe, that Lake Tahoe, but I didn't see that much snow. So I was like, fine, you're probably right. You're probably right. And then, but then to, to convince me even more, he took a video camera with him to the snow over Christmas. And so that was, uh, that was good, good evidence for me. But I said, OK, let's, let's submit this with our sum paper submission so that people won't worry about it. <laughs> but, then, but then, of course, nobody worried about it except for me. I was the only one that thought it looked funny. <laughs> so this, these are sort of the simple demos that we did. Um, this was two years before the movie came out. And uh, two years or a year, maybe a year and a half at this point, um, before the movie came out. And at this point, they, they stole my student from me. Um, and he basically was just at Disney for the whole last year of his PhD because they needed him to run all the shots for the movie. Um, so his intern project turned into basically consulting that was really full-time consulting. And then they hired him after his PhD to work there full-time. Um, they, they call this solver at Disney, they call it Matterhorn, um, after the ride at Disneyland. 
Um, but here you can see it in action for some of the deep snow sequences where Anna's riding the horse here. This is probably the most expensive sim from the movie. This is 30 million particles, and it took three days to simulate. The sad thing is that after like five years of um, optimizing this code, now this runs in, instead of three days, it runs in like 20 minutes. <laughs> Not even changing the algorithm, just optimizing our implementation. <laughs> but this was one of the more expensive ones. This is in the trailer, and it's in the, in the TV commercials. I think this is my favorite one. This, is for, this was also from the TV commercials. One of our co-authors had to help do the, the actual um, the art direction for it, too. This one, I like this one because my daughter has a frozen coloring book, and there's that scene right there in the coloring book. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you can see it sort of adds dramatic effect uh, when he's trying to struggle his way back up the mountain. Here, we, there's also some snow sims across here when the, when the wolves are coming across the way. Here you can see snow sim without the fancy rendering. So when you're making the movie, you don't do that like full polished final rendering that you see. It's usually rendered at lower quality when you're just trying to get the dynamics of the snow to look good. So here you can actually see that you can more clearly see the individual particles of the snow when you're running at like a few hundred thousand of par particles. This one's kind of crazy too because there was a bug in this. Like the, normally we have to bounce the snow off the animated characters, and there was a bug in the way that we were bouncing the snow off of this wolf and the snow actually flies right through his head. And we told him, we're like, the snow is flying through the wolf's head. And they're like, oh, don't worry, no, it's, you can't tell. It looks fine. <laughs> <laughs> so the snow flies through that guy's head when you see the movie. <laughs> um, it, it was, I, I do my consulting on Thursdays, so um, every Thursday I would come in and I would talk to Alexi, the first author, and, I'd be like, oh, and he'd be like, they just want to go back and put snow on all kinds of shots that have already been done. They just want to put it on everything. He's like, look at this boat. They're putting snow all over it. I was like, wow, this looks so cool. And then when I watched the movie, I was like, this was like one of my favorite ones. I was like, what happened to that boat with all the snow? And it's like, oh, they put a snowstorm in front of it. You can barely see it for like <laughs> one second. <laughs> uh, but just to give you an idea, um, you know, this was part of the, th this came from the R&D effort um, at Disney. But when they started doing the movie, they didn't have a snow solver. So they, they had like other solvers. They had like rigid body solver, dust solver, water solver. Um, and uh, they, had, they wanted to try to get the snow dynamics without the fancy physics, so just trying to cobble it together from other solvers that they had. So they said, okay, let's use a really procedural approach to the snow. So we'll say that, first of all, what the snow does is wherever the character steps, it just sort of goes up around their foot. And that's what you see. So wherever the character is stepping, the snow just goes up. Uh, but it looks really bad. It doesn't look like snow. So then they said, okay, well, let's just try to kind of hide it so we'll have these little like rigid chunks that fall off, and these are just the dynamics of rigid bodies. So it's like a baseball that can roll, basically. So it's position and orientation is the degrees of freedom for it. And it looks better, but it's still like you can see it floating above the snow, and like what's that doing right there? And, um, and so then they try to uh, uh, they try to hide it even more, but just to like let's simulate some dust, some extra dust that's flying around. Maybe that will make it look a little more real. So you can see this dust that sort of comes out of nowhere and floats <laughs> above the top, but. Um, but it, I mean, if, you, if, if there was no R&D, then you would still see, you know, you have to do something. So this is what it would have been like. And here, here's what it was with the, with the full-fledged PDE in physics, discrete physics. And then here you can see the side-by-side -side comparison. So the, the crazy thing about this is that uh, we started from the engineering literature when we were doing the PD, when we were start, um, designing the, the constitutive law, the plasticity law, really, for the, for the snow that gave us our PDE. But we simplified it, took a lot of liberties with it to make it easier for us to control it, to get a visual look. Uh, but uh, it turns out that uh, we did a pretty good job because uh, there was a, a snow scientist at EPFL, um, Johan Gom, uh, who saw Frozen and couldn't believe how well we were capturing, capturing certain snow physics that we didn't even know we were capturing really well. So this guy is an ex-snowboarder who now researches um, snow from a mechanical point of view at EPFL. And they do all kinds of experiments for, for trying to understand the way that avalanches are uh, caused. And they'll go up onto the mountain, and they'll dig out a big piece of snow here on the slope, and, uh, this, and create this like peninsula of, sl of snow. So they kind of carve in the front in, inwards, and in the back you get this peninsula of snow. And what they're looking at in the field is uh, how the weak layer in the snow will create, will create an avalanche. So 
what can happen through a, after a very deep snow uh, is that you'll get this temperature gradient in the snow, where the snow is a lot warmer closer to the slope and then very cold in the, closer to the air. And that temperature gradient draws water away from the slope. And it dries out this layer close to the slope that they call a the weak layer. And then that weak layer can fracture like a brittle material. So a crack will propagate through that thing like, gra like glass. And then that, that, that layer will fail and cause the snow to come like falling down on you on a hill. And so that can lead to a phenomenon called remote triggering. So here we've got this little snowman that we're going to drop on our, our little synthetic um, mountain here. And he's going to rupture the weak layer. And that rupture is going to propagate up the mountain like a crack propagating. And then that's when you get into trouble in the, on a mountain, because then all the snow is going to come crashing down on you. So we were able to take our uh, uh, plasticity law and start from what we did for frozen, modify it slightly, and agree with experimental snow behavior that, uh, that Johan had in his lab. And uh, we ended up, we wrote that, this paper over the summer and submitted it to um, Nature of Materials. It's in review right now for the actual science literature for physics of snow. So sometimes we, we go back to the computational physics literature. So here you see our remote triggering avalanche simulation. And this is the same algorithm that we use for frozen, except for fine tuning one of the, basically fine tuning the plasticity law so that um, we can capture these types of behaviors. And so when this guy fell down, there was a crack that shot up the mountain underneath the slope. And then you see the avalanche. <laughs> so at this point, I'm going to uh, acknowledge my various uh, PhD students over the years, as well as postdocs and collaborators at um, Walt Disney and also DreamWorks. And uh, at this point, uh, thank you and open up for questions. Thank you. So we have time for questions. You can come up to the microphones in front. So it looks to me like you've got two different kinds of, of dynamics that you can do. You can either do a, a continuum type of dynamics, which you showed at first, or you can do a granular dynamics. Um, what um, if, if you're sort of in between where you start to have frag <coughs> phenomena like fracture and, uh, or say breaking up of drops, how do you handle that? Yeah, so the, 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 all of the fracture that we see is numerical. So basically you have the, um, the, the PDE itself, we don't, we don't put any, well, we put very little uh, insight from the fracture phenomena into the PDE. Right? When, we do it, when we discretize it, there'll be a numerical change of topology because it's a particle method. Right, basically, we, we're representing the snow as, as particles, which means you can never really tell if it's connected or separated. Right? The notion of whether it's connected or separated is sort of like how close are two particles in terms of they'll interact through how they go to the red grid. So we don't have to actually model any um, fracture explicitly for, say, like the snow or the sand. It just comes from the, the numerics of the way we're discretizing the continuum. That has its pros and cons. The pros are that we didn't have to do anything. We got topology change for free. And the cons are that, well, we don't have any control over it either. We get whatever we get from the numerical fracture. Now, if you, for the, um, the weak layer there that we saw for the avalanche, we were actually trying to control the way that cracks propagate in the weak layer by doing a, a, a weakening law in the plasticity. So in that case, we did try to influence the way that we got fracture behavior through the plasticity, which is what's commonly done for the engineering literature. Some spray? Oh, oh, wait. For, so for Moana? No, no, no. Like we get into this with the, you know, the tumbling column and then you have some droplets, you know, breaking off. For snow or for, for water? For water. Oh, for water. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the water is it's essentially the same algorithm as for the snow, just a different equation of state. So again, those water particles, they'll separate um, numerically as well. Thank you. Um, do you ever have to like 
of what you're making to like satisfy some kind of aesthetic sense of how we would think things work or are people generally pretty good at recognizing what like the natural way things work are um so for the most part the way that we distinguish between say like water and snow it all comes down to that that p that we saw in the governing equation is just the way that that p depends on the rest of what's going on so um depending on how we choose it we can get jello or sand or water or snow or lava just all from just the nature of that p um, and so that's basically you can get all kinds of crazy stuff by just putting different different um, laws for the p in there but there's so many different things that you can get that for the most part we want to just look at the engineering literature to see oh sand they usually do this or snow they usually do this and that gets us to where we can just plug that in and it will tend to look it will tend to look like you would think it would so basically if you take jello and then you say that the stress for the jello has to be only inside this a certain cone that's how you that's how you get sand um, and usually that will be what you want for the, for the visual aesthetic. Now, I'm trying to think of a case where we took some uh, equation from the engineering literature, discretized it, and it didn't look like you would think it would look. Um, I can't think of one right now. Uh, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Uh, but, but a lot of times what we can do, though, is we, we don't have to do exactly what's in the engineering literature. We can do a simplified version of it, which is what we did for snow in the first place. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, when you were talking about the uh, the method where you switch between the particle sim and the Eulerian sim, uh, and you said you interpolated between the two, yeah, are the particles like local to each cell, or is there some way where they can move uh, to different cells in the Eulerian? Yeah, they're, they're, the particles are going to move around, right? So the particle, the motion, the those particles move, and that's how you see the snowball drop. But at any given point in time, it exists in the context of like a conceptual red grid, red grid that fills all of space, right? So a particle will only talk to the grid nodes of the cell that it's in, okay. right? It would only interpolate from those, those nodes that it was in at that time step. But then it will move, and at the next time step, it would interpolate from some other grid, from other, some other grid cell. Right, thank Does that you. make sense? Yeah. Uh, for these, we use GPUs and many core. For Moana, we use, I'm uh, sorry, for the, for the snowballs, we use many core G CPUs. For Moana, we use distributed CPUs. But uh, over the last year, we did a GPU implementation of the algorithm for Frozen, and that is 10 times faster on the GPU, but we haven't used it in production for GPU version yet. Okay. Uh, yeah. what, which aspect of Frozen? The, just the snow dynamics that you just saw. So th those are, most of those sims are about five years old now. And those are all done many core CPU. Um, but now, yeah, so basically, using a GPU, we can run 10 million um, particle snowballs at the same speed that it, that it used to take us to run 100,000 um, particle snowballs. Yeah, how do you parallelize it? How do we parallelize that? Well, the, the kernel that, we pr that needs to be parallelized the most is transferring between particles and grids. Okay. And so if you, go from, if you go from grid to particle, that's sort of inherently parallel because each particle can be done. Um, automatically, but going from particle to grid is um, trickier because different particles talk to the same grid cell, and we split the grid up based on local chunks that don't talk to each other, and then those can be done in parallel. But it's really uh, very, um, very nuanced. It took basically five years of optimizing that kernel is what went from 100,000 to 10 million. Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. You. So I, I think we should um, probably end it here. So I just want to thank. Uh, Thank you. Professor Turan again. <laughs> <laughs>